number of topics. I'm going to start with just providing you with a uh, brief overview of my background and also the background about the book. Um, and then we're going to use the uh, webinar tools to do a quick quiz that will provide me with some background information about where you all are regarding your current attitudes towards uh, money management. And I hope that those questions will also provide you with some insight into your current attitudes towards money management. I'm then going to talk to you a bit about why it's important, if you're not already, to become a saver now. And then we'll talk about some money myths, which can be a barrier to achieving financial freedom. And then we'll discuss the principles of financial freedom, which are the bulk of what's contained in our book, and really provide a roadmap towards uh, achieving financial freedom. At the end of the presentation, I will provide you with some resources that are available online that you can use as you work on your journey. And um, I'll also provide you, as I mentioned before, with information about how to obtain a copy of the book. And then finally, um, if there are any questions, please feel free to post them during the presentation. I will be able to see them. And if I can address them as I'm talking, I will. Otherwise, I will um, address those questions at the end of the presentation. So here we go. First, a little bit of information about me. There's a picture. And my name is Chris Messner. I am a Kappa from the Gamma Epsilon chapter, which is the University of Pittsburgh. I'm not a native Pittsburgher, but I did go to school there. And so uh, that became a Steelers fan. So guess who I'm going to be cheering for on Saturday evening against the Ravens. I'm also uh, right now the president of the Westchester, Pennsylvania Alumni Association. Westchester is a small town in the uh, western suburbs of Philadelphia. And I've been living in the Philadelphia area for about the last 15 years. We're currently experiencing a snowstorm. Um, I don't know what the weather's like where you guys are, but hopefully you're having a little bit nicer weather than we're having here. Um, as you can see on the screen, I'm also involved in several other nonprofit organizations in treasury functions. My professional expertise is that I started my career in banking, and I have particular expertise in the area of cash management and um, payment processing. And I also do business process consulting, which is what I'm currently involved in. I work with small businesses in the area of business process and uh, technology implementations. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the book Save America and how that came to be. Um, the book was written by my husband and myself. My husband is Tom Petro, and he is the CEO of Fox Chase Bank, which is a 140-year-old community bank based here in the Philadelphia area and also uh, in New Jersey. And the book is based on our personal experience, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that as we go through the presentation. We published the book last year, so it's been just about a year. It is available on Amazon.com, and all the proceeds from the sale of the book uh, benefit the Fox Chase Bank Charitable Foundation, which provides grants to community-based organizations here in the tri-state area, which includes uh, the Philadelphia area, Delaware, and New Jersey. Uh, and the real reason that we wrote the book was that we uh, became aware of some uh, issues with some of our friends and acquaintances who were really struggling with uh, the idea of being in debt beyond their ability to manage it, and also with their inability to manage their personal finances. And we were talking about it and remembering a time uh, when we first got married and also struggled with those same issues, um, being too much in credit card debt, uh, really not able to get a handle on our finances. And now remember, both of us were bankers at the time, so uh, we really scratched our heads at that point in our lives and said, why can't we do this? Um, and realized that maybe it wasn't as obvious as we thought it might be. And a good friend of ours at the time sat us both down and said, OK, here's the plan that you need to get yourselves on. And it's really the program that we outline in the book. And um, there's no magic, but it is a basic process for taking hold of your financial um, management and for 
leveraging yourself out of debt and into a point where you're comfortable managing your own financial status. And so we felt very strongly that it was time for us to share that gift. And so the book was, was really born out of that um, idea that we wanted to share the gift. Um, we do sell the book, but we mostly give it away. And so I'm happy to be able to make the offer at the end of the presentation tonight to um, give that book to any of you that are interested in having it for your own journey. So uh, I want to use the um, <clears throat> online tools that are available to you, and I want to post some questions for you to answer. And I'll, I'll um, be able to use that information then as we proceed with the presentation. So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is to just do a really quick self-assessment about your own money management um, ability. And the question, you're going to see that on the screen here in just a second, is when it comes to money, um, what do you um, see yourself in terms of um, how, do you, how do you think you view money? So if you would please just click on one of these responses, either spender, builder, giver, or saver. I'm going to give you a minute to do that, and then we're going to close that poll and move on to the next question. Okay, and I see that everybody has voted, so I'm going to close that poll, and I'm going to share those results with you. And um, I think that's a, a really interesting mix, um, not, not untypical from what I typically see when I talk to audiences. We've got a mix of spenders, builders, savers, and a few givers sprinkled in. So now I'm going to ask you some more specific questions regarding um, how you feel about um, your uh, ability to, to uh, manage money. And this question is regarding uh, managing uh, what would happen to you if you won a big lottery. I mean, we all dream of that. So let's, let's answer the question, if I won the big lottery, what would I do? And so if you would please answer one, or respond to one of those questions. Okay, it looks like you've all voted on that. So let me share those results with you, and you can see where we are. Um, only a few of you think that you would never have to think about money again, and we're almost evenly split between the remaining answers. I'm going to hide those results, and I'm going to move on to the next question, and that has to do with what would you do if, or how do you feel about managing money? And so I'm going to post this question up here, and I'm going to ask you to respond to um, how you feel about managing money. Okay, and I see that everybody's voted uh, for that, and so I'm going to go ahead and share those responses with you. This is a really interesting mix. Um, we've got um, very few that say that most of it is allocated to family and charity. Um, a number of you think you keep close track of spending and investments, and then we've got a few that um, are not sure where their money goes and some that uh, have a pretty good idea but are, are willing to spend money on anything that they think is a good idea. And the final question I'm going to ask you has to do with how you feel about credit card spending. And so if you would please go ahead and respond to the question about credit card spending.
Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and share those responses with you. Um, very interesting responses. Um, we don't have anybody uh, who's giving them to their kids to teach them about spending. And that may be a function of uh, where you all are in terms of your life. You may not be at a point where you have kids that are, are old enough to have a credit card. Um, many of you think they're a handy alternative to carrying cash. And, and a few of you think that they uh, allow you to have what you want when you want them. Um, and it looks like maybe only one person uses them to invest in good things that you can't avoid right now. So I'm going to go ahead and go back to the uh, presentation and show you what the money attitude results are. So many of you at the beginning categorized yourselves into one of the categories of spender, builder, giver, and saver. The questions out of that mini uh, survey, and there's actually a more extended version of that that we use when we're doing one-on-one -on -one counseling, um, but, but it really, uh, based on your answers, is, is telling you what you really are. So for example, if you mostly answered A, you are a spender. Now that's not a value judgment. Um, it's just a statement of where you are at this point in your life. And if you are a spender, then learning how to save is going to help you get out of the debt that you are most likely in. Um, if you answered most frequently B, you are a builder. If you answered mostly C, you are a giver. And if you answered mostly D, you are a saver. So what I'd like you to do is think back to what you answered at the very beginning regarding whether you thought you were a spender, builder, giver, or saver, and see whether your actual responses actually um, mean that you really are what, what you thought you were. And um, in many cases, when we do this survey, um, people aren't what they really think they are. So um, you can judge for yourselves whether you are, in fact, what, what you thought you were or not. Um, and the only reason that it matters is that it just gives you an idea of where you are on the journey towards financial freedom as you start this process. I um, wanted to talk to you a little bit about why it's important to become a saver now uh, if you're not already. And some of you obviously already are. Um, The average credit card debt in the United States right now is $8,000 plus. Now, I need to explain what that really means. Half of all households don't have any credit card debt. Um, so what that really is saying is that those people that are carrying household debt are actually in debt for about $16,000. And when you consider that the average household income in the United States is $50,000, what that's really saying is that some people are actually in debt as much as or more than a third of their ho average household income. That's a pretty deep hole to dig yourselves out of. So if you are finding yourselves in a position where you're in credit card debt, you really need to think about how to get yourselves out of it. Um, unemployment rate is declining a little bit, but it's still relatively high. It's at 10%. And why that's significant is if you, you haven't been saving and you do become unemployed, it's very difficult to manage to stay out of debt if you have no savings uh, to fall back on during a period of unemployment. The savings rate in the United States um, happily is growing, but it is um, still relatively low at about 5%. And nearly half of all American families are spending more than they make each year. Uh, retirement is going to cost more than what you think. <clears throat> Some sobering facts about that. Um, a third of millionaire lottery winners, these are folks who get that big pop of, of uh, winnings and think that they're never going to have to worry about finances again, actually find themselves in financial trouble and in many cases are filing for personal bankruptcy within five years of winning their lottery. Um, some more statistics uh, that we've been able to, to research, 43% of Americans have less than $10,000 in retirement savings, and 27% have less than $1,000. That's a really frightening number um, when you consider what you're going to need to live on in retirement. And in 2009, consumers paid $38 billion in overdraft fees. Now, why is that significant? Well, if you're paying overdraft fees, it's probably because you haven't got a good handle on managing your household budget, and you're, you're causing yourself to write checks when you really don't have money in the bank account. And that's, that's a scary place to be. 
time equals money, and that's the primary reason why you want to become a saver. Um, a dollar today is only going to be worth 40 cents in 30 years because of the rate of inflation. So if you think that you're going to need $600,000 to retire, you're really going to need a million five hundred thousand. Now, many of you are saying, "Oh my God, where am I going to get a million and a half dollars?" Well, the way you're going to get to that point is by starting to save now. Those of you that are still in school or just recently out of school, just beginning your careers, a dollar invested today at current interest rates, despite how bad they are. Um, it, that dollar is going to be worth $835 in 30 years. So the point is, you've got to start saving now. No matter where you are in your life journey, you've got to start saving. I mentioned earlier that there's some money myths that can be barriers to uh, achieving financial freedom. And I, I like to think about this um, in, in terms of one of my favorite TV shows, which is The Biggest Loser. Um, my husband, Tom, and I are really addicted to this show. We love it. Um, and one of the reasons that we like it is because the folks that are on that show learn to overcome not only their weight and, and eating properly, but they learn to overcome the, the emotional um, barriers that are keeping them from being able to lose weight. In many cases, the root cause of their obesity is some deep-held um, emotional feeling that has really nothing to do with food, but it has, has a lot to do with their self-worth. Um, and what we find in working with folks that are trying to get themselves out of financial troubles is that deep down, besides whatever issues they have with spending and um, you know, their current financial position with regards to credit card debt, there's some deeply held belief that they have about money that's completely false, that's, com that's holding them back from achieving the freedom that they need to go ahead and be um, in charge of their own personal financial situation. Um, and there's a lot of detail about this in the book, and I'm not tonight going to be able to go into all of these in great detail, but I want to hit on a couple of my favorite ones. Um, and number one is probably my all-time favorite, and it's one that I will tell you that at the, at the age of 20-something, I totally believed in, and that was, all my money problems would go away if I just made more money. Uh, my husband and I were recently married. We were both starting out our careers. We were both in a position where we were advancing. And we kept saying, well, gee, you know, when you get that next raise, we're going to be in great shape. Or when I get that next raise, we're going to be in great shape. Or if we could just get another $100 a month, we'd be in so much better shape. Well, the reality was because we didn't know how to effectively manage our own finances, the more money we made, the more debt we were in. Um, and the reality was that the more money we made, the more money we spent. And our money problems didn't go away as we made more money. It just got bigger. Um, so that's one of my all-time favorites, and it's completely false. And um, your money problems won't go away if you make more money unless you learn how to manage the money that you have. Um, Another one of my favorites um, is number eight, I can't afford to plan for my retirement. If you saw the screen that I showed you a, a couple of minutes ago where I talked about the time value of money, the reality is that you can't afford not to plan for your retirement. Um, Social Security is not going to be a fallback for many of us. It's going to provide at most 40% of what we need to retire on. And so we really need to be taking control of our own retirement and planning and saving for that now. So that is another money myth that will hold many people back from um, being able to control their own finances. And then another one that I just want to mention briefly because we see this one a lot in uh, some of the counseling that we do, and that is two people can live more cheaply than one. Now, in theory, that makes sense. If you are paying $1,000 for rent and there's one person paying it and you share that rent with two people and they each pay $500, well, obviously each of them is contributing less money per month than they were before. The problem with that is that many times the two people um, each spend the savings. So 
So in other words, you think, oh, I have an extra $500 a month I can spend because I'm not spending as much on rent. And you go out and you spend that on something that um, is not in your current budget. And the other person does the same thing. And before you know it, you're back to number one. You're just spending more money, but you're actually not living any more cheaply than one. So it's a myth um, that you need to understand when you're going to go ahead and live with a partner that you can't just automatically begin spending more because you think that you're going to be saving money on the rent or the utilities or the other things that you're going to be sharing. So I want to talk about the principles of financial freedom. And we're going to go into each of these in a little bit more detail as I go through the rest of the presentation. Um, this one just gives you a, this slide just gives you a brief overview of those principles. There's no magic to this. I wish there were. Um, you can't wave a magic wand and all of a sudden achieve complete financial independence. And one of the things that I want to make sure that we're all understanding is when we talk about financial freedom, we're not talking about being at the point where you never, ever have to think about earning money. Um, and we're not talking about some get-rich-quick uh, pro uh, program. That's not what this is about. When we talk about financial freedom, we're talking about the ability to feel like you're in control of your own finances whatever those are, at whatever income level you are, um, that you are in control, that you know where your money is being spent, that you are um, able to direct money into savings, and that you are comfortable with where you are financially. Um, I'll go back to my, my example of the biggest loser. If you look at those folks, th those folks are never going to be model thin. That's not their goal. Their goal is to, to get to a place where they're comfortable literally in their own skin and they are um, at a place that is healthy and that they can sustain a healthy lifestyle at a weight that they're at. But we're talking about the same thing with financial freedom. We're talking about being in a place where you are healthy and comfortable with whatever income you are able to achieve in your life. Some of us will have more income in our lifetimes than others. You know, there's lots of reasons for that. Some of it is luck, some of it's uh, family, some of it is your job. But the point is that where, no matter where you are, you can get to a place where you are living within your means and you are living comfortably within those means. And the principles of financial freedom can get you to that point. So the first thing you have to do is you've got to make a budget and stick to it. Now, it's principle number one. It's really short. It's just a couple of words. But it's not, um, it's not without significance. And I won't kid you and say this is easy. Anybody can do this. It is easy enough that anybody can do it, but it will take you some work. And what does it mean? Uh, many people are intimidated at the concept of, of making a budget. Um, I've worked with some folks that were really frightened about the idea. The easiest way to, to go about making a budget is to get a template. Now, we've got some online at our website, which is uh, featured here, foxchasebank.com slash saveamerica. There are other budget templates available all over the web. We have budget templates in the book that you can use. Um, if you use a tool like Quicken to, to reconcile your bank account, they've got budgeting tools. So there's any number of tools out there, and no one is better than the other. The point is that it's probably easier if you get some sort of a template, an Excel spreadsheet, and use that rather than just starting to, to, to do that from scratch by yourself. Um, the next thing you're going to need to do after you have a template that you're going to use is you're going to need to gather your financial records. We suggest that you try to find about three months worth of your financial records because you will have expenses that don't um, occur every month but may occur on a quarterly basis. And so if you get several months worth, we, uh, you'll, you'll typically catch those periodic expenses if you average them over several months. Um, we say that it typically takes about two hours for you to pull together all of your financial records, 
and also uh, drop that into a template and take a look at where you are today. And we actually use a three-step process um, for um, doing a budget. What we do is we say, go through and create an estimate of what you think you're spending on each category. Then go through your financial records and create what you're actually spending on each of those categories. And many times there's some real eye-opening experiences as a result of taking a look at what you think you're spending versus what you're actually spending. Um, and then the third stage is to actually create a new budget that's based on what you think you should be spending. And that's the can't cut, could cut, cut process. And I'm going to show you on the next slide, I'm going to show you um, a little example of what I'm talking about. But essentially what you're going to do is create a new budget based on your cut. So let's take a look at uh, part of a um, budget template, and that this hopefully will explain what I'm talking about in a little bit more detail. So this is actually from the budget template that we have on our website and also in the book. And uh, this particular category has to do with your living expenses. So if you were working with your budget today, you would take a look at something like your mortgage. And you would say, OK, your mortgage in the short term or your rent, whichever you're paying, if you're renting or buying, is a fixed expense. In other words, unless you move, which we're not advocating that you go out and move tomorrow, or unless you refinance uh, your mortgage, which you may not be able to do right away, um, you're not going to be able to change whatever it is you're spending for your mortgage or your rent. That's a fixed expense. You've got to pay it, or you're not going to be able to live in your home or apartment. So that's going to be in the can't cut category. And in your final budget over on the right, that's going to be the same amount as it, the current expense. In other words, if you're currently spending $1,000, you can't cut it. You're going to be spending $1,000 in your projected budget. But let's drop down a few lines to the category of furnishing, furniture and decorating. And let's say that, as an example, this particular person was spending an average of $200 on furniture and decorating for their home. Um, maybe a little bit too much Martha Stewart. I don't know. But the point would be that this person could look at that and say, you know, if I really want to get some control over my finances, perhaps I really don't need to spend that $200 a month on furniture and decorating. And so, at least in the short term, I'm going to go ahead and cut that out of my budget. I'm not going to spend any money in that category. So they would be putting that in, uh, current expense into the cut column. And in the final column, where we talk about the, the new budget, they're going to put $0. In other words, they're planning not to spend any money in that category in their new budget. And then finally, dropping down to the last item on this uh, excerpt, where we look at cleaning uh, services, cleaning person, and a handyman. Again, let's make an assumption that this particular person is spending an average of $100 a month for someone to help with the cleaning services in their home or apartment. And they make the decision that they're not quite ready to give all of that up, um, but maybe they could cut back to a lower frequency. And so, and so instead of spending $100 a month on that particular category, they might be only spending $50 a month on that category. So they would put $100 in the could cut column because it's an expense that they're going to cut. They're not going to cut all of it. So in the final budget, they're going to put $50. So when we look at the sum for this category, our current expenses were $1,000 plus $200 plus $100, which is $1,300. And in our new proposed budget, we're going to spend $1,000 plus $0 plus $50, or $1,050. So in other words, they're proposing to save $250 out of this category. And you can see how this process works. You would do this for all of the categories in your budget. Now, the second one, give yourself an allowance. Um, and I have a question here. How do you, how do you uh, excuse me, the question is, how do you determine how much allowance to give yourself? That's a really good question. Um, what we recommend is as you go through your budget process and you take a look at um, the money that you are spending on quote unquote miscellaneous expenses, whatever those are, um, that's a pretty good guide to your allowance percentage. You may also want to include some other categories into your allowance. 
Um, for example, you may want to include a personal clothing budget in your allowance. You may want to include things like lunches eaten um, away from home in your personal allowance. Um, it depends a lot on your particular situation with regards to are you working outside the home, do you need to buy a lot of clothing for your job, in other words, do you have to dress professionally. Um, there's, there's a lot of, of factors that go into that and the allowance is probably the category where you need to do some um, adjustments on your budget as you work through. In other words, you create a budget, create an allowance amount, try it out for a month or two. If it's not working, you might need to go back and adjust it. But the reason that you're doing the cash allowance, just to get back to sort of the basics, is um, a couple of things. One is you want to eliminate the need to account for small dollar purchases. We've all had that experience where you go to the ATM machine and you take out some money, and at the end of the week or a few days, whatever it takes for you to spend that money, you look at your wallet and you say, oh my God, I don't have any cash left. What did I spend that money on? I have no idea. Um, those are the small dollar expenses that are really hard to track and really hard to put into a budget. Um, they might be the things like going out for coffee um, in the morning on the way to work. They might be the things like having lunch uh, at work um, if you're not taking a bagged lunch or not able to eat at home. Um, so unless you want to be running around writing down all of your expenses on the back of an ATM receipt, which really becomes burdensome, and we don't advocate that because people won't do it, um, we suggest that you give yourself an allowance that you're going to go ahead and spend and not worry about having to account for that dollar amount. It also, and to get to my, um, my question here about, um, because there's a question about how much the, this each of the spouses agree on, it can eliminate a source of conflict in relationships. We see this a lot where he says, well, you spend too much money on shoes. And she says, well, you spend too much money on golf balls. And before you know it, we're embroiled in a, a deep argument about, um, in, in many cases, relatively low dollars of expenses. Now, it can be higher, but in many cases, that's a manageable amount that we shouldn't be arguing over. And the number one reason why um, couples in the United States get divorced is over finances. So we, we hope to help you try to avoid getting yourselves embroiled into um, arguments over money by saying, give each other an allowance and then don't question each other about it. If she wants to go out and spend all of her allowance on a pair of new shoes that are completely frivolous, then he should say, okay, that's your allowance. That's what you want to spend it on. I'm not going to question it. And the same with her. If he wants to spend it on Titleist golf clubs or golf balls, then that's his allowance. He can do it. It also gives you buying freedom. You can buy anything you want with your allowance until it runs out. And you know this sounds ridiculous, but you really have to hold yourself to it. If your allowance is a weekly allowance and you get X dollars per week, then at the end of the week, if you don't have any cash left, you've got to wait till the next week before you go ahead and take more money out of the ATM to get your allowance. Um, when we were young and just trying to implement this ourselves, I actually cut up my husband's ATM card for a period of time because he wasn't very good about monitoring his allowance. And so um, we gave him his allowance, or I gave him his allowance, and he didn't have an ATM card to go and get more money towards his allowance until the next period of time when, when I would give it to him. Now, I don't necessarily advocate that but because uh, that was fairly extreme, but you know that may be the kind of situation where if one of the, the couple or parties in a couple isn't able to control themselves, he may actually have to try to, to take control of that situation until the person learns the new behavior that enables them not to have to have that control in place. We also advocate restricting the use of debit cards. Um, Tom calls this the death by a thousand swipes. And what we mean by that is for many people, spending through a debit card doesn't seem real. In other words, if they're not taking cash out of their wallet, they're, they're not really recognizing that I'm spending money. So what we advocate is that you use your debit card for your budgeted purposes. In other words, things like gas, groceries, um, budgeted um, health and beauty aids, um, 
household purchases that you're making, things that you're tracking in your budget. Because when you do use your debit card, many times the information that's transmitted electronically through your bank helps you to categorize that in your budget tracking process. Um, so using your debit card in that case actually makes it easier to track those expenses. Obviously the alternative is you take cash out of the ATM and then you have to write down on that ATM receipt that you spent the money for gas or for groceries or whatever. So in many cases it is actually easier to use the debit card for a budgeted expense. But what you don't want to do is use the debit card outside of your budgeted expenses. So you want to really restrict the use of your debit card to your um, uh, budgeted expenses. We next, the next principle is to establish cash reserve accounts. Now, this may be an, an unfamiliar term for some of you, so let me just quickly explain what a cash reserve account is. A cash reserve account is simply a savings that you are building for a particular purpose. So, for example, you may have a cash reserve account for um, car repairs. And that's a, that's a really good use of a cash reserve account. Everybody's going to have car repairs. They typically come as a big expense on a periodic basis. In other words, you don't spend money every month on car repairs, but maybe every six months you've got a giant sum that you're paying on a, um, a, a car maintenance expense. So what we would advocate is rather than trying to constantly be managing that unexpected expense of maintaining your car, that every month you set aside some money that's going to be used to pay for those maintenance, that maintenance on your car. Um, so you're actually setting cash aside every month towards that expense. You can use it for replacement of major appliances. Um, for example, I know I need a new dryer soon, so I've been setting money aside for the purchase of a new dryer. Um, you might be using it for saving money for um, a vacation or for your child's education or for your own tuition payments if you happen to be enrolled in a college program right now. Um, there's a couple of reasons why you want to use a cash reserve account. One is that if you have the money set aside in savings, you don't need to use your credit card for those periodic expenses. It's also psychologically much easier to save when you have a specific purpose in mind. If you're setting aside money every month for the trip to Disney World, it's so much easier than just saying, well, I'm putting money into savings for whatever I might need it for. We are programmed uh, to really focus on goals. And so it's much easier to save when you know what it is that you're saving for. Now, in terms of how you actually do this, there's lots of ways you can do it. You can set up separate accounts, especially if your um, bank has some of the new tools that are available for um, budgeting. They actually enable you to easily set up new accounts that you can start to direct small amounts of money into without any fees for having a separate account set up. If that's not a viable option for you, you can always just track how much is in your savings account that you've allocated for a particular purpose. So when you, you know, if you have $500 set aside in your savings account and you know that 100 of it is set aside for a particular purpose, you can have that tracked on an Excel spreadsheet or in a, a Word document. Um, you can also do it in cash if you're really, you know, if it's not a large dollar amount, you may be more comfortable with just putting an envelope and sticking some cash in it every month. That works too. Again, whatever works for you, it can be used. Um, the next uh, principle is to start paying off your debt. Obviously, if you're in debt, you really need to focus on paying down your debt. Um, you want to pay down your highest interest rate loans first. And uh, the new credit card bills that, or credit card uh, laws that went into effect recently provide an easy way for you to do that.
Hello, can you all hear me now? Okay, can you all hear me again? I hope so. I apologize for that. I somehow lost the audio. So I was talking about I was talking about paying off the debt, and what I was saying is that the new credit card laws provide more information on your statements that you can use to uh, determine how much it's actually going to cost if you don't pay off the full amount of your credit card bill every month. Um, so. Um, there's also calculators available online, and I'll talk to you about that uh, towards the end when I provide you with the resources. Um, but that enables you to do some what-if analyses. In other words, if you find that you can free up an extra 50 or 75 or or $100 a month, and uh, you want to know, well, what will happen if I start to pay additional money on a particular credit card debt, you can actually see that using those credit card calculators. The other thing that we say as, is an important principle of financial freedom is paying yourself first. And we talked about this earlier, this whole idea of saving for retirement. You're going to need 75 to 100 percent of your current income to maintain your lifestyle in retirement. And re, uh, the reality is that Social Security, if it's going to cover anything at all, is probably only going to cover about 40 percent. So you're going to need to supply the other 60 percent. And where that's going to come from is your saving um, and using the power of compounding interest to save over time. That's really the only way you're going to, to be able to achieve that goal. And then fi the final me uh, uh, financial principle is living within your means. And this kind of gets back to what I talked about earlier with what financial freedom really means. Financial freedom really means learning to live within what you have available changing your mindset about what it really means to be financially free, and having a plan for your life that's not about what you have, but really about what you do. Um, and one of the things that I want to encourage everybody to think about is that what you do and what you share with the people that are important to you in your life um, are far more important to, to your, the quality of your life than having a lot of things. Um, some of the best memories that I have as a child, and I grew up in a family without a lot of money, um, is the things that my parents and my, my relatives did with me, not the things that they gave me. And I think that it's important for us all to remember that um, as we live our lives and, and plan to give to our children. So how do you get started? Um, well, obviously, I'd, I would encourage you to read the book and complete the forms. Uh, if you don't want to read the book, that's fine. But go ahead and, and work on getting a budget. Um, and if you have additional questions or would you like would like some additional information, you can contact me, and my contact information will be provided uh, on the final slide. Um, this is a financial activities timeline, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that other than to say that there are things that you should be doing on an annual, monthly, weekly, and daily basis that can help you um, in a routine of managing your finances. And if you do these things um, and make them a part of your daily life, you're going to find that it's much easier to manage your finances and feel like you're in control than if you attempt to do these things in bulk once a year or you know once every three or four months. It becomes overwhelming when you're trying to do a lot of this at once. So we encourage you to do things on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis as well. So some resources that are available. Again, if you send me an email uh, using the contact information on the last slide, I will be happy to send you a free copy of the book, Save America. Um, there are consumer credit counseling services available. I've posted the one for the Delaware Valley, which is the, the area that I live in. There are similar types of nonprofit consumer credit counseling services available throughout the country. The thing you want to do if you're going to take advantage of one of those is make sure that you're working with one that's a nonprofit whose mission is to work with people who need their help. There are many 
so-called credit counseling services out there that are actually for-profit enterprises, and they're not necessarily interested in helping you. They're interested in making money off of you. So be sure that the ones that you're looking at are a nonprofit. If you can't find one in your area, please feel free to email me, and I will be happy to help you track one down in your area. There are uh, many of these kinds of services available um, it, all over the United States. There's a savings and interest calculators available at bankrate.com. That's the um, what-if scenarios that I mentioned to you. And then finally, you should always be taking a look at your personal credit report on an annual basis. That's important if you are uh, trying to make sure that you uh, have a good credit rating so that you can get the best possible credit rates, because as you know, the uh, better your credit score, the better the rates that you're able to um, obtain when you do need to get credit. Once a year, you're entitled to get that. That's a, a federal requirement. And the only place that you can get it for free is at annualcreditreport.com. Again, there are many other websites out there that will say that you're going to get a free credit report from them, but they are really credit monitoring services that will be charging you for that service. So you need to go to annualcreditreport.com to get it for free. And again, that's a, a nonprofit service. So if you have any other questions, I can see them here. Otherwise, um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have by email. My email information is right there on the screen for you. It's kemessner at verizon.net. I hope that this webinar has been useful to you. It's been a pleasure to speak to you this evening, and I wish you all a very good night. Thank you very much.